Hello, Luke Taylor here, and welcome to another Cork and Taylor Wine Podcast. And I'm excited because I have gas. <laughs> I got some gas. We got the sil- good kind people. The, the, the good, good kind. kind. We got Silverdor Brands, who actually, this is how I found Silverdor Brands. Um, and go to www.silverdorbrands.com. The link will be below. Click on the For Your Home and enter Cork and Taylor for 10% off your next purchase. And I really like these things. I think it's a great product. I've done lots of experiments with it myself. I'm a big fan. It does what it's supposed to do, which is give you uh, more time uh, to enjoy your wine at the same quality uh, when you pull the cork. But it's so light. Uh, Isn't but, it crazy? You yeah, always think it's empty. You, it, That's it, as long as it's making noise, you're yeah. in good shape. When yeah. it stops making the p- p- sound, yeah. you're you're out and you need another one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we got that. Hey, just uh, remember to, uh, we're going to talk about the the wine, the Cork and Taylor Wine Madness. Uh, uh, Larry was uh, kind enough to help with the judging. We're going to talk about that. You got to get on there. We actually just got uh, Rydell. Is it Rydell? Riedel? What is it? Riedel. Riedel. Riedel uh, donated some friendly, um, or not donated, paired a uh, part. Gave us some prizes for first, second, and third on top of Fly With Wine, uh, Corvin, uh, who else, Silverdor Brands, and um, got some good stuff. So they're going to give some friendly wine decanters and friendly wine glasses to first, second, and third. I've never heard of a yeah. friendly wine decanter and a friendly wine glass. I th- Everything, every glass and decanter is friendly. As long it? as it's got wine and if it's empty, it's totally unfriendly. Yeah, totally yeah, unfriendly if true, it's empty. True, true. Well, I mean, anything from Riedel's pretty cool, right? I yeah. mean, uh, I th- I, is that just the name of a new line, friendly? Is it like uh, maybe user-friendly, won't break maybe, as easy, maybe. that kind of thing? Yeah, my, my, the last couple of times, uh, the Riedel, uh, the glasses, we've had, they're real thin and they're beautiful glasses. Yeah. But uh, we've had Maximilian on the podcast. Just remember also to uh, uh, subscribe, rate, and review on Instagram, Facebook, and on your favorite podcast provider. Also follow us on YouTube. You're obviously watching and subscribe, but we appreciate Comment. Tell us how lovely Larry looks and how skinny Not this and this morning. That's why I was late, man. I, I'm rough today. Yeah, your hair is kind of... Yeah. You're like Einstein today, boss. Yeah, I'm sticking in it. I'm actually going to get my hair cut. Today. Nice, That's nice. Good. Yeah, we're going to do... Getting quaffed. I've got a barber shop. We'll do the barber shop in my office right across the, the hall. No, no, no. We're not doing that. And just forget... Uh, don't forget to uh, support us on Patreon, www.patreon.com backslash Cork and Taylor. It just helps us to uh, keep going to some great stuff. So about a week and a half ago... Well, about a couple months ago, I reached out to Larry. I said, I've got this concept and I've got this idea. And, you know, maybe I'm crazy, but I played basketball. I played basketball at a pretty high level way back when. Um, I can't get off the ground much like I used to and probably like him with sports. And uh, I love wine. We both love wine. I'm passionate about wine. I obviously am in the wine industry like himself. I said, what about doing like a Cork and Taylor Wine Madness? We're having like 22 or inviting all the guests on the podcast, including yourself, and doing kind of a... Uh, single elimination, blind tasting, led by you and some other psalms, local psalms in the uh, Cleveland area, <coughs> and see who can win. And we got, I got 22, and you got two, which is good. Yeah. Yes, like how many can I get? Yeah. So now, since you're on here today, next year you can have three. Well, I only want, to, I think, two's fair, and plus it keeps it sort of balanced. I don't know. It just seems symmetrical. Yeah, but if, we, yeah, but if, we, get up to, if we get up to 32 teams. Well, then that's another, yeah, that's that's another, another story. That's another story. Because next time I go out to Napa, just hook me up with Free Mark Abbey or something like yeah. that, or whoever and that way you can have then it's a thing so we got some were you are you like now that you see the draw that's come out you don't know who won you don't know who did anything you don't know who won the tournament i know i know what i tasted (laughs) and and it was a fascinating opportunity (laughs) to see this most important category this we we did in fact know that these were cabernet based blends by and large there uh, i think you told us at the beginning there was one exception to that rule and the brutico uh, coral uh yeah uh and um i i, I sort of had my radar up for it and mm-hmm. i really you know i think i spotted that wine i don't know if i spotted that wine but it'll be fun to go back and look at my notes after the fact once everything's sort of revealed mm-hmm. um it, so we sort of broadly knew what the category was but it was it was a lot of fun to challenge your preconceived notions of what a quality wine within the bounds of this Cabernet blend category would be. And and, and I don't even know, were there, were, there, were there Merlot wines that had some Cabernet in them, or was it just mostly uh, there was, Cabernet with well, Merlot? Well, them? you have Rutherford Hill, Oakville Merlot. So that was one, and okay. that was, and then the Paloma. Was a hundred percent Merlot. Was hundred percent Merlot. Okay. And then the Mernay was fifty fifty. Right. Merlot. Okay. So it was interesting to see. I mean, I would say if you look at the list, 
it was Cabernet Sauvignon heavy, right? I mean, it was. I mean, you look at Fremark, sure. you look at Mira, you look at um, Dunn, Pride you look Mountain. at Trioa, uh, Dow, I mean, you know, Stone Street, you know, Vengue is cab-based. So, I mean, Matera Hidden Block. I mean, you can go through this Pride, Eberly. I mean, you go through the list. It's It was Cabernet heavy. I told you, like, what are the primers? I said, well, it's going to be big, bold red, and it's going to be red. That's all you're going to know. Right. And that's all you knew. Yeah. What do you think, now that you kind of know what's on the list, because you didn't even see the draw. The draw was no. literally set the day after. We, we took a walk back after the tasting to see what was in the tasting. Mm -hmm. And I was just speaking to one of the other judges on the ride over this morning, and he he when he walked back, he was shocked at, like what was in there from every from every perspective, sort mm -hmm. of shock things that he didn't necessarily think he liked, mm -hmm. and things that he held in high regard. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, and then it then it as soon as he saw, well, things that I don't necessarily think I like, I wonder how I graded them. Mm -hmm. Things that I hold in high regard, I wonder how I graded them. It was, but isn't it amazing when you do that? And I and I want to start doing that more, or just like doing a tasting of some other stuff I don't usually drink because you get you know set in your ways and stuff like that with your wine, round wine all the time. The yeah. last thing you want to do is wine. We well, get a house palate, right? You, you you fall into a a pattern of liking what you like and not. Mm -hmm. Very, you know, getting outside the bounds of that. I, you know, I'll liken it to, I haven't dined in San Francisco in a long time, but should I be in San Francisco and I want to dine, it won't be someplace new. I'll default to the, yeah. my level of comfort, which yeah, is A16. So when it comes yeah. to wine, I'm going to default to sort of my level of That's comfort. That's funny. I go to the same, so I go to Napa, as you know, a couple times a year, and I go to the same place, Don Perico's. Good Mexican, yeah. if you want some good Mexican, and uh, some other places. And I mean, that's just how it is. Yeah, you, you default to your level of comfort. And when it comes to wine, it's probably one of the worst habits you can have is yeah. defaulting to your level yeah. of comfort uh, because there's so much more <laughs> opportunity to enjoy when you get outside right. the bounds of what you're comfortable with. And I think this is a really cool thing. I, I was telling you off air that uh, an Instagram uh, a supporter of Cork & Taylor uh, – Wine podcast reached out to me and said, "You know, I've never heard of some of these wineries." Yeah. And the funny thing is, when you really look at it, Corley's been doing it for fifty years. Oh yeah, I, Corley was on the wine list at the Wine Merchant <laughs> the year I started in this business in nineteen eighty nine. I mean, they are, they yes. are a stalwart. Yeah. Now they don't they might only produce eight to twelve thousand cases, but they've been around for fifty years. Layered. Yes. Owns the most vineyards, uh, most acreage in all of Napa. The most famous family names in all of Napa Valley wine history. And you would yeah. think about it. It's Modern like history. they've been doing it for almost 50 yeah. years. Stone Street, even one of your brands. Yeah. Freemark Abbey's been around since 1886. Yeah, I know that. And, and they had a... They had high highs in the you know the eighties and into the nineties, mm -hmm. and then unfortunately there were some low lows toward yeah. the end of the nineties. And since Jackson families had it, um, we we've been able to put it back where it mm -hmm. belongs. But again, still people aren't necessarily aware of its history and how long it's been around. Right. Yeah. And there's a couple Kaluna, Matera. And I've never heard of Kaluna. Kaluna, and they've been like well, why, like one of the top wineries of the year in wine and spirits. He does. He's Chalk Hill. I've been there multiple times. I sell it. It's it's gorgeous. Gets good scores. But under the radar. Same with Honada, you know. The now that name I had heard, but I'd never had Screaming the wine. Kind of, kind of sexy Honada. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it is, and it's not Cabernet based. You know, it's got a whole bunch of stuff in there. It's got uh, Syrah, I think Petite Syrah, some Cab Franc. It does have some Cabernet. I think it has a little bit of Merlot. It'll be interesting to see yeah. how that did in the midst. It has Merlot and those. I other think so. Kind yeah, if I remember correctly, yeah, I should cool. probably know because I bloody sell it. But yeah. whatever. I, I like to say it changes every vintage. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy. But then there's like a couple like Paloma. How is a Merlot going to do in this tournament when you're dealing with big bold see, caps? My memories of Paloma are nothing but holy. That's good. Mm -hmm. um, like as good as Merlot gets in California, mm -hmm. like Paloma up on Spring Mountain. I mean, shit, they were winer of the year. Yeah, Barnett up on – I mean, mm -hmm. these are some of the, the definitive – uh, producers of Merlot, and and I am one who is constantly preaching that sermon that mm -hmm. a good Merlot is capable of pleasing a cab drinker every bit as much yeah. as cab. A, 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 a little insight, by the way, for those that you know that are Bordeaux fans and hold Bordeaux up as the as the bastion of Cabernet Sauvignon, it's hard to find a more classic sort of sixty thirty ten cab Merlot. Uh, Cab Franc, Petit Verdot mm -hmm. kind of blend. There's as much Merlot planted in the Madoc now 
as there actually there's slightly more Merlot planted in the Medoc than there is Cabernet Sauvignon. Why? Uh, that's a good question, and it's likely a number of issues. Most importantly, I think it's just balancing your vineyard so you are going to get a good crop every vintage, mm-hmm. given the fact that that those two grapes sort of break bud differently, set yeah. uh, are harvested at different times. There, there's just that balancing act that a good farmer always wants. But I think probably even more important than that is they're making wines that please a broader audience or, yeah. or, 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 or maybe in their minds better qualitatively than they've been because – they're more Merlot heavy than they've ever been. I tasted an 06 Chateau Palmer, Palmer for those that want to say it on Francais. Palmer, we're in America. Palmer. <laughs> uh, and that wine was 5644. Wow. Cab Merlot. And it and it was stunning. And I still sensed cab is a very dominant feature, but I think one of the reasons I thought it was so stunning is because it was 44% Merlot, man. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Yeah, so this this concept that that Cabernet has to be the dominant feature, mm-hmm. I mean, in most cabs, you know, like mm-hmm. uh, Freemark Abbey is an example, 82% cab would be mm-hmm. a lot of cab for Freemark Abbey. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's normally sort of low 70s into the high 80s, and Merlot plays – a big chunk. Do you think that part of it is the, just the cost of uh, the grapes? Like, it's because Cabernet is king and it's the most expensive. Do you see it with the prices rising and obviously with 2020, like a yeah, like, no vintage? I mean, right? it's pretty much 30% of yeah. usual production. Correct. And I will tell you, all the 2020s I've tasted, awesome. Yeah. I mean, the, we had some in the pot. We had some in this, I, I this think competition. I, when, when you see reputable producers releasing a 20, I think you can rest assured the wine quality is worthy of of the name on the label. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's just a matter of you know it's it's a matter of the chutzpah of the producer to sort of forego. Well, you can't make wine in twenty. Nobody could. Well, it all depends on when you picked. It all depends on what you picked. Mm-hmm. It all depends on what your lab reports came back with. Mm-hmm. And the truth is. You know, ladies and gentlemen, come on, ladies and gentlemen in the wine audience, mm-hmm. there's a way to clean up some of that smoke. There is, and they're very effective ways. And the truth but. is, I don't think most consumers, you know, could tell a wine that that that's been treated to remove some of the the, the issues. But be that as it may, I, I, in any event, whether it was treated or whether it was just not tainted, I, I think there's a possibility that there's some twenties out there that are really drinkable. It's just not a lot of producers are going to be willing to take that. Well. Risk. And ex- and I think also too the smaller producers, um, like a lot of the people I've had in the podcast, they can't afford no it. can't because just if, skip if a there is one or two judges or the general pu- pu- public doesn't like it, they're screwed. Yeah. Because as you know, it's like the whole retail mantra is if it's off the shelf or it's out on a wine list, that ain't coming back. Right, it's hard. It's, it's hard to get it's, it back. Yeah. I mean, exactly. I mean, it's like you got to pray for. How you got to go to like church every day to get back on that wine list because yeah. then the consumer, unfortunately, now if it's let's say one of the bigger name producers like a Camus, and I'm not knocking Camus, people know it and they'll they'll wait for it and they'll buy it and they'll probably sell out quicker and they yeah. can charge more. Yep. So, but you know, I mean, it is what it is. So it's interesting because you have like Mira, you might not have heard of. Nope. Um, you know, that's a really good wine. But then we had a couple like Soul of a Lion Dow. And we had Austin Hope. Mm-hmm. I mean, those are known. Extremely popular. Uh, the, the, what Daniel Dow has been able to do in Paso. Paso was coming anyway. Paso mm-hmm. was on fire. Yeah, but he. He threw gas. Him and his brother. Fire. Yeah, him yeah. and his brother, George. I mean, they threw. Yeah. Because they're brilliant entrepreneurs. They're passionate about wine. Mm-hmm. Don't don't think for a minute they're not passionate about wine, uh, but they're also brilliant at creating image and reputation. Well, and I mean, they 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 went from nothing. I mean, they literally had nothing, and they grew a business. They sold it, and it's not like those one. They uh, now we had Daniel on the podcast, and him and his brother do not seem like the type. They're doing this for shits and giggles. Like it's like, no. hey, look at me. I got all this money, no. and I'm doing it. Like if you talked, if you've ever met him, which you probably have, I've, I've no, I've not met him. Just via, yeah. uh, actually, via virtual. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We've had a little. Yeah, and I have too. Like through through uh, through, we did a podcast, and he was. I mean, he's brilliant, and you can tell he takes it seriously. He's passionate, and I yeah, think he's that's deeply the involved thing. Yep. in 
vineyard development, vineyard management, vineyard uh, g- grape selection, clonal mm-hmm. selection, uh, roots. Like he's deeply into all of that. I, I, I think we we mentioned it. Mm-hmm. Uh, he he bought an estate in Tuscany yeah. recently in the yeah. Valdorcha, I think, yeah. which is. Right on the edge of Brunello territory. I'm not exactly sure, but I just remember reading yeah. that, that he'd. So yeah. th- this this guy and his brother, they're not done. I think they're they're just right. sort of establishing but don't, this. But business. don't you see like the Cathards who own uh, Chateau Smith Hot Lafitte? Yes. They just opened a winery in Napa as we're yeah. speaking. Yeah. So you're seeing, and then you see, um, uh, we had Carlton McCoy, who you know personally, he's yes. a master song. And head of uh, Lawrence Wine Estates, yeah. they just bought Chateau Les Combs yes. last year yes. in Margot. So I mean, it's as it's... succession planning sort of fails mm-hmm. around the world, and by that I mean the next generation to assume the reins, no matter where, right. France, Italy, California, Oregon, Washington, yeah, wherever it is. Yeah. As as the next generation looks at the challenges of being. A winery owner and an entrepreneur. Easy. It ain't easy. No. <laughs> so this this concept of consolidation that everybody I shouldn't say everybody, a lot of negative publicity about the consolidation nope. within our trade. Well, it's just sort of an inevitable thing because it's it's not easy to make money as a landowner, grape grower, winemaker. No. And there are companies that have built sort of a, a better you know, mo a, a business model, and that's why you're well, seeing I mean, this sort you, of consolidation. You work, you, you work I with work what? for probably one of the finest families in the world in that right, regard. Right. I look at the Torres family in Spain. Mm-hmm. I look at uh, but, uh, the 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 Gaggi family that is behind Jadot. I mean, these are brilliant right. people. But they're also, but you're also my worry, okay, and especially in Napa because that's my you know that's my playground, my sandbox. I worry. That the people that are purchasing, not Lawrence Wine Estates, okay, I'm not them. I, I wouldn't say that. I'm not going to, I mean, a lot of sold. You know, the big thing's going to be with uh, Schaefer. How's Schaefer going to be? I mean, a South Korean uh, mall, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think if the investors do the right thing, which is a long term play rather than a short term play, I think Schaefer will be just fine. I think a luxury goods company, and it's my understanding that that South Korean company is, in right. fact, kind of a, a, right. a version of Louis Vuitton, Moet right, and Hennessy right. kind of yep, thing. Yep, 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 I mean, yep. com- those guys are long-term oriented. Right. I think maybe their financial goals are a little more um, intense than mm-hmm. maybe some others. Right. But but if they're long-term oriented, that's what you have to be in the wine industry. Right. Uh, it's it, like if you're in the inter- intra- intraday trading Forget wine. Like that's not where you want to be. If you want to collect wine and maybe uh, maybe look for some appreciation over the long haul, great idea. If you're buying wine to flip in the next six months, the way bourbon is being flipped these days, maybe not the best idea. Right, so. right, right. So it was funny when you see the people. Just remember to go to uh, www.challenge, c h a l l o n g e dot com backslash cork and Taylor wine madness. So some of the names for uh, the predictions, the people that entered uh, the free bracket, okay, to win some great prizes. Th- these are funny. You're going to get a kick out of some of them. Better than Spit Bucket, <laughs> Wines and Dimes, Merlot All the Way, Not So Sideways, Well Aged, Slightly Toasted. I like that one. These are these are the, the na- titles. So like you you enter, you put your predictions, and you got to have a title. So okay, okay, got it, got it, got it, got it. I've got it, yeah. uh, Miracles Happen Every Day. That's actually the uh, present Ed Thralls of Mira because that's that's kind of their kind of uh, concept. Uh, and then Creighton Macy for the win. <laughs> Creighton basketball? It's, 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 no, inside joke. Okay. So Creighton Macy played for Marquette. I hate Marquette. I was the men's tennis coach at DePaul and a graduate of DePaul. Big rivalry. Yeah. And uh, Sam Davidson, who's a supporter of the Patreon, of the supporter of the Cork and Taylor Wine podcast, thought he'd be funny and put Creighton oh, Macy okay. for him. He it. used to beat the shit out of him on the tennis court. <laughs> it, it makes me cry thinking about that. So you're looking at these. I'll be curious to see how some of these do, okay, and how they're going to – you know, there's a couple like Mar- Mary Hill Serendipity from wa- – our only Washington producer. Is it going to hold up to Kaluna, which is kind of a big uh, 2016. That's her current vintage. You know, it's uh, kind of big and rustic, and how's that going to hold up? How is some of these others, like Brutico Coro, going to hold up with Chimney Rock? Yeah, I mean, that's, that. Uh, you know, based on what I know about Coro, Coro's kind of that odd Mendocino 
uh, appellation of sorts. They, they they have rules about the grape varieties Thunder that are allowed yep. to be in there, and yep. and um, I think they only produce like three hundred twenty six cases. Yeah, yep. and and it's it's just an odd sort of juxtaposition to a classic kind of velvet. You know, what do they say? The 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 iron fist and the velvet glove yep. thing about Stag's Leap and Chimney Rock definitely exudes that yep. style. So yeah, it, it it'll be very interesting. Plus, I, I, and the other thing that we were talking off air just before right. we came in. What became very apparent to me is there there are two distinctly different paths red wine is on these days, and it's almost irrespective of grape variety. And the paths are fruity, grapey, mm-hmm. big, ripe, rich, um, versus more classic more dry, more savory, a little more chewy, puckery, dusty inside mm-hmm. the cheek, mm-hmm. on the gum line, surface of tongue, roof of mouth. Um, and then even within that, there were, uh, you know, a couple other subsets. There were a couple wines that had a little bit more of an old world, mm-hmm. dare I say old world yeah, sort of character. Yeah, I loved your character. notes. I loved your notes. There was something, <laughs> uh, you know, the French would say the goutte de terroir, mm-hmm. that taste of earth. And it's really not a taste of earth as much as it is just a little bit of, you know, spoilage yeast in your wine, adding some complexity. And, I, and we're not going to get deeply into that. Right. But in short, it's just a just a different way of making wine with a little bit more tolerance for the beauties of imperfection. Mm-hmm. How poetic was that? that was, beautiful. That was beautiful. You're in the wrong the, industry, my The friend. beauties of imperfection. It's kind of the, you know, the Japanese concept of wabi-sabi, right. that there's beauty in small imperfections. And I tasted some wines that I thought were like, you know, not perfect as in, you know, a 10 or a hundred, 10 of 10 or a hundred points of a hundred, but just like beautifully made. Mm -hmm. And then I tasted some wines that had the small imperfections. And ultimately I voted for a wine that had some small imperfections that added to the complexity. I think the the wine that I ended up choosing as the as the winner of the of the of the whole thing from from my bracket wasn't the perfect California cab. It wasn't overwrought and fruity by right. any means, but it wasn't without its little issues that make it a little different than what might be the you know the 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 Cindy Crawford standard of beauty, right. if, as it were. Yeah, she's aged well. Um, we're not, we're, we're absolutely not talking about aging well and <laughs> women age. I'm not getting anywhere near any of that. I'm not talking about Tom Brady or anything about how people age. I'm not, just oh, not. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. That's fine. Uh, Walt Disney's I just, aged I well. I, I, I don't need how about Walt Dis- How about Walt Disney? He's aged well. He's frozen still. Yeah. It, it, or his head. Is it just his head? Oh, I think it's just, isn't that weird? Yeah. Well, whatever. That's, that's here and there. Lou, Lou Gehrig. Not Lou Gehrig. Um. Not Babe Ruth. Uh, no, the left-handed hitter. Uh, Not Mickey Mantle. No. Mickey Mantle. Oh, Sidney Louis won it. Cardinal. It, well, oh, we're, we're, um, we're off onto a weird yeah, tangent here. Okay, That's <laughs> freezing heads like cryogenesis. <laughs> yeah, I mean, do you put it on a different body? I, you might. I mean, in Futurama, they just left it in a little case. Yeah. And it, <laughs> it's really, it's we should put of, like the Pope head being yeah. and you are like boo good about poor or something. Like that. So. What's interesting to me, okay, because you're talking about old world style and kind of like big, you know, tannic, rustic, done, Napa Valley Cab, 2018, one of my favorite wineries of all time. Mm-hmm. I love Mike. I might have twisted his arm. I can be pushy a little well, bit. Well, I, 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 we were talking about that off air too. Like, what's done need to be here for? Like, th- their, their reputation is sterling. But then mm-hmm. I, I give Mike Dunn a lot of credit for allowing his wine to be in a flight and be and be challenged. I, I think that's awesome. You know, the truth is I didn't necessarily talk to our marketing team about Stone Street and Fremark <laughs> um, because I, I don't know how they'd respond. And, you know, I, I hope your podcast explodes, but I hope my guys in the brand and marketing yeah. team aren't listening. <laughs> so don't tag uh, Instagram. Uh, yeah. so I got to stop tagging Instagram. Okay, that's fine. Be, and you know what? I would have, th- I, I would think that Fremark would be a wine that would have done pretty well. Where mm-hmm. Stone Street, I'd I'd kind of scratch my head because Stone Street is such an unusual style. It's very savory. When you open that bottle and you pour that glass, I'm like, mm. and I told you, got you that. to do it in the back. And I told yeah. you, yeah. yeah, yeah, we got to do a lot of things in the back. 
<laughs> at the end, it's like, oh shit, like, oh, uh, we gotta get the right rides. You know, because you, you're like, shit, you got all this open wine, you, you gotta, gotta try be, it. Yeah, and, and I it, gotta try too because I've got to talk about yeah. it and giving predictions and stuff like that. But so it, it's I, you, you just have expectations of how a wine like Dunn is going to do. Mm-hmm. You just think, well, well, damn, that's into the quarters, right? Just well, I mean, bang. it was the second seed, and the first seed was Keenan Murnay, and I must, I must say. I've got to start charging him for putting that damn bottle back up there because he used to be a sponsor of the Cork and Taylor Wine Podcast. Still hasn't done it in a while. So, And he got the first seat. And I had nothing to do with it. So I just want people to understand. I mean, he's a good buddy and stuff like that. I mean, the wine was legitimately good. Yep. But I, I, what I worry about, and I guess the biggest thing is all these wines are good, well-made wines, mm-hmm. right? I mean, there was no duds are like oh god what the hell are you doing to me and it was funny to see your guys's reaction facial reactions and just your your overall um body language mm-hmm. where you're like like you know i saw a lot of head nods or, or like you you'd be like you know like it was it was you because you didn't know what i was going to bring all you knew right. that it was former guests of the cork and taylor wine right. podcast and we've had some but, and ad- even then you've, you you mentioned names a bunch of times and i'm i probably did remember right. that dunn was one of the names right you know, but again, a lot of the names I didn't know, and most of it I, I did try to go into it w- right. with as clear a palette, as blank a slate as possible, um, and just judge the wines. And again, <laughs> it's brackets of two, ladies and gentlemen, in the yep. audience, meaning yep. head to head. And there were could have been, and there were One several time. instances of really good wines side yep. by side. Yep. And there can only be one to emerge, so there's got to be yep. that one little thing that you choose that puts that one wine ahead of the other. I think you mentioned there was one tie. Well, there was one tie. Yeah. There was one tie. What did we do? How did you? So there were six judges, um, and it was four out of two, uh, four, four to two, four to six voted higher, higher point. So that so was I the tie. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. I had to kind of do that on the fly because I'm like, no, that's, no. that's a fair, that's well, fair one, enough. Actually, yeah. one of them, Most points. one of them, I think it was in the quarterfinals uh, of the bracket, they won by 0. 0.25. 0. 0.25. Yeah. And the I mean, it, and that's what it gets down to because it's such a subjective thing. And, right. and subjectivity doesn't limit you to liking just one thing. Maybe you love mm-hmm. both of them, but it ultimately. You got to you got to pick one. Yeah. And uh, and I Highlander. think that's the thing. So we we did on a 16 point scale, right? Yeah. And how did how did you kind of set that up? <laughs> well, we well, were honestly, trying to do 20, it was, but <laughs> it was a it was a Google search people. That's yeah. how it Um the, the the 20 point system is the classic kind of English European system. Mm-hmm. It, it, the French system, the, in the judgment of Paris in 1976, they used a 20 point system. And for our purposes, you know, I just don't see giving four points no. to appearance or two points to appearance. It just doesn't. Well, you already know what it is. It's a yeah, red wine. Yeah, a, a, a Appearance yeah. can be something attractive, but look, it's the aroma, the flavor, the texture, the and the completeness, the wholeness of the wine um, that, that really matters. So by just sort of eliminating the appearance stuff and a couple little uh, peripheral one-point categories, mm-hmm. we got it to 16 points. So 16 was the max each wine could score. I think I remember giving a wine as much as 15.5 yes. or 15.75 yes. or something. Yep. Like 15, perfection five, yep. is yep. rarely achieved. Yep. I was speaking to another one of the judges on the way over, and he said like the highest score he thinks he gave was about 15. So um, – and that's 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 a healthy score, but I mean, what, what, what were some of the, there? There were some low scores, I'm assuming. You know, uh, yeah, I mean, there was some low scores, not ridiculous though. That's the thing, and I think that is an, a, a testament to all these wines. Yeah. Like, I mean, they're none of them are. You don't see them everywhere. I mean, you might see Austin Hope and you might see Dow everywhere, but they're not. Austin Hope was the one because it has a tinge of sweetness to it, yeah. just a tinge. But yeah. it's not like, oh my god, could you pick any of these wines out? Like, if if you could, you pick out your two wines. I thought I could, but obviously I didn't. No, you did not. I, I you did not. I and no. I I really thought I could pick out Stone Street. I was saying that earlier. Yep. Stone Street's very unique in its dusty herbal tobaccoy. A dried, savory, mm-hmm. like it's it's is is if you had thyme and oregano and bay leaf and some some really good Maduro tobacco that got dried out. You stuck it in a food mixer and you pulverized it yep. into a dust. There's this lovely complexity that rises over the fruit, 
And I really thought I could find it. Well, you know what's funny? And I thought I did, but you I didn't. think I mistook it for some other wine. You did. Yeah. And that's the funny thing, because if I would have, if that would have been the first wine in round one, I think you would have gotten it. Yeah. You know, uh, but, you know, Venge played against Rutherford Hill, and it's like you've got two different dichotomies. Then you go to Matera and Peachy Canyon, both cabs, yeah. one from Napa, one from uh, Paso. Mm-hmm. And I was impressed with the Peachy Canyon. Uh, the Divine Cap, because they're really known as a Zin producer. Yeah, I mean, it's Paso. For sure. And it was excellent. Then you got Kaloon and, and Mary Hill, both. And then Pride and Eberly was one I really wasn't sure about because you got Pride 2020, uh, Mountain, you know, Cabernet, which is really interesting because he's on the podcast just this past, before us, this past, this last week, last Thursday. And they're Napa, Sonoma. They're literally yeah, on the right, line. You can stand the there line, with yeah. like leg. I mean, it's like, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, so that was Amazing interesting. mountain vineyards. Oh, it's gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. And then um, Laird versus Austin Hope. That's another one I yeah. wasn't too sure because Laird is prototypical Napa Red Blend, Cabernet based. It's their not. It's their only blended wine. They all do single varietal wines. And then Chimney Rock and Brutico. And it's like that was going to be interesting because you've got kind of a, a, a stalwart in the uh, Napa community of Chimney Classic Rock. Classic Napa Classic. Valley Stag Sleep. Yep. yep. And, versus uh, something unusual. Yeah. And, and would think, yeah. would the unusual be, you know, different enough, attractive enough to, you know, to to, to beat the classic style? Mm-hmm. And and I and, and that's ultimately what it gets down to. There were six judges. And I don't know if you've if you've named the names of the six judges, but mm-hmm. they were all local people, <clears throat> serious. We had one person who's not in the trade, just a very enthusiastic yep. consumer with a high degree of education in wine. Yep. We had a very powerful local buyer. We had a local wine shop owner. We had a local sommelier. Um, I'm t- trying to think who we I'm- We had you, Master Song. We had me. Yep. Um, so there, there were very distinct ideas about wine and everybody's perspective is different. And I think the joy of this entire process is that the consumer at the end- Gets to taste all these yeah, wines. March, March 30th. Yeah. March 30th. At March 30th, it's a Thursday night. I'm just putting the final details. It'll be out soon. Uh, March 30th at the Hilton Akron Canton. Uh, we're going to have two of your wines. And yep. then, and then I'm, you, I'm uh, trying to attend. Yeah. But if, if I can be there, I will be there to yeah. pour my two yeah. wines for sure. Yeah. And then we'll and then maybe you'll bring some more stuff. Because I'm, I'm not just- Indeed. We're going to have 22 wines, but we're also going to have some other stuff. And it's going to be wineries. Like we're going to have the Ramey Claret, which I think every day the, the Ramey Claret is a great- Red blend. Yep. You know, we might have Cliff Lady Cabernet. Yeah. We might have a couple other Keenan. We might have some, obviously, some of your stuff that you might want to dabble in some other places and stuff. But like that. I, I, th- I think we have to be very clear that these were the wines. Yep. Like when the consumer yep. gets to enjoy, these yep. were the wines in the contest, and you have to vote. Mm-hmm. I think the consumer has that opportunity to vote, and just to, just to compare yep. with what we ended up choosing and, uh, I, and i'm gonna have i'm actually gonna print some of these sheets off i mean the 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 challenge will still be going and they won't be able to maybe enter and maybe it's a thing of maybe that night i throw a prize out you know yeah. i throw out a decanter or something that we've got and stuff like that so they can win something so that's going to be uh we'll have it out pretty soon uh march 30th it's a thursday night at the hilton a- akron canton gonna have a dj i think I'm going to have DJ make it fun and lively and stuff like that. You know, just fun. You know, yeah. probably I might only limit to 50, 60 people and I'll probably only get 12, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> that includes me. I don't and know. The if, other if I was a local wine nerd, this would be very interesting to me on, t- on top of the fact that, yeah, there'll be some other cool, fun yeah. stuff that we'll throw in as yeah. well. Yeah. 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 Is there any, lastly, is there anything different for next year? that you would do differently from a judging perspective? Would you add more people? I mean, we're going to probably hopefully add some more wines. Yeah, I I think if we added some more wines and, you know, again, figuring out the whole bracket thing, thank God you did because it's just not how my mind operates. Um, I think adding more wines would be a lot of fun. I think maybe defining it a little more specifically. um, Hell, maybe we could even do it for, you know, maybe we – maybe. By adding more wines, maybe we add another category. Maybe we do a white thing. I don't. I don't. Know. I'm just spitballing right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I also think uh, diversifying the the judging a, a bit mm-hmm. and and maybe bringing in a couple more consumers and a and maybe a few servers that that are a little salty and seasoned. Just 
just to, so it's not just so maybe one 10, type of maybe judge. ten judges. Yeah, yeah instead yeah, not of not just six. one type of judge. Yeah. Maybe there's a contest and you select a judge uh, yeah. via the contest yeah. uh, from from, from yeah. podcast listeners. Or or I could do like a, a fundraiser for the podcast and say highest bidder. Ah, that, I can be bought. Yeah, you can. Hell be, yeah, yeah, I'm in wine not? sales, baby. I can be freaking <laughs> bought. Twenty bucks is twenty Every, bucks. Everything has its price. Oh like, hell yeah, everything has. Its I'm price. a married man of eighteen years. <laughs> I can be bought. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I think that's, I think that's, I would like to never, I would not like to get more than 32. I think that's from a time perspective yeah. and, and just to me, and I think it moved, you we, know, we well. went, we went, we went pretty damn fast. Mm-hmm. I think we started right around 11, 15, 15 yeah. and, and maybe by 230, 245, yeah, 235, 240. Yeah, we yeah. were done. Uh, and part of it was that there were a limited amount of judges just the the mm-hmm. six of us yep. uh and i i did kind of lay down the law and and invoke the cone of silence as we were tasting mm-hmm. so as not to influence one another and 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 preface the whole thing by asking the judges to be focused and and serious about what they were doing so it did move along pretty quickly it and it's just it's you know allotting for that amount of time to increase yeah. the wines and yeah. making sure that the judges are kind of i kind of want to get a shot clock like basketball and then like six minutes yeah. like let's say we instead we do 10 minutes maybe do seven minutes okay right. so three and a half minutes each right and the buzzer goes off so it sh- scares the shit out of you guys <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well you, the, know, you the, see it five it's four. the pitch clock now and the batter has to stay in the box yeah. and there's a pitch clock in the mlb and yeah so yeah absolutely. It, i mean the truth is for those in the audience that think, yep. the, for those in the audience that think that's debilitating, diminishing the amount of time you have with the wine, it's not. It, it, it demands that you focus more intently. It demands that you um, move through your process rapidly, but you're responding viscerally at the same time. You've got to have a process. You've got to have a checklist. Uh, of things that, that that you're seeking in in terms of aroma and flavor and texture and wholeness, I can't overemphasize that that the in that category where there were like four points, like completeness of wine, wholeness of wine, overall thoughts on the wine. That's a that's kind of a a make or break category for people. So the, the, the going fast, I always equate it to driving fast. When you're driving at 110 miles an hour and it's late at night and you're having a little fun driving 110, man, your hands are on the wheel, your eyes are on the road, you're looking for deer, you're you're looking for cop, you're looking for you you're doing nothing but focusing on driving. Well, when you're tasting fast, it's the same thing. Yeah. Same concept. Interesting. Focus. All right. You're going to stick with us. I want to ask you something about uh, about judging and scoring wines in a second. Uh, don't forget to uh, join the free uh, first ever Cork and Taylor Wine Madness by going to challenge.com backslash Cork and Taylor Wine Madness. They'll be in the notes and they'll probably be right under here somewhere. Um, follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Also, thank you to Silverdor Brands, Fly With Wine, uh, Corvin, Riedel, and uh, Bramoli Rocco. Ah, Did you say Bormioli Rocco? Yeah. Uh, uh, Bormioli. Bormioli Rocco. 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 Yeah. Really, really good. Really good stems. Yep. Uh, really good providers. Uh, by the way, G- Gary Gottfried's our uh, proprietor of Silvador. Local product, Ohio product. Yep. Uh, the cans from Piqua, and it's filled just over the border in Pennsylvania. So, yep. and it is a really good product. Yep. Like Corvin is a great product. Yep. This is as well. Yep. Just slightly different application yep. of the yep. gas. Yeah, and if yeah, yeah, I do actually have gas. I haven't. Well, that's yeah. keep that. To when, I wine, literally, when, I, when I had my wine, when I had my figuratively and literally. When, when keep I had, that to when I had my golf podcast with Ben Curtis, I think he stopped talking to me because I would just like I just would. Get, I don't know around. You know, you get around. Oh, that, that's what I, I don't know. know. You get around we, people. You get another, gassy. But, he was one of them, and he would be like we'd be talking to like jason day and he's like are you serious i never did it when we had like jason coke right or any other pros in here but uh local youngstown guy warren guy uh jason coke, yeah guy, yeah guy. live dot tour big uh, hitter yeah big hitter uh also join our patreon page to get some great benefits and what have you just help support me and stuff like that to get to great places www.patreon.com backslash cork and taylor thank you to gareth clearfield uh stephen shear sam davidson and angela to do so uh thanks for listening thanks for watching and we'll catch you up next week on the uh, cork and taylor wine podcast <laughs>